banging the gavels for you guys. But anyway, I want to welcome everybody for coming this evening. I know there's a lot of people from all over Fox County and here this evening. It's not only people from Bristol Borough. A couple years ago, I took a trip to Harrisburg to meet with John about this bill. And I think it's a good bill. I know there's a lot of pros and cons to anything that passes. But it's still a working project. It's still a work in progress. And uh, I asked John, he contacted me a couple weeks ago. Here's the mic. John had contacted me a couple weeks ago about doing a town meeting in Bristol Borough. So I thought it'd be good because there's a lot of people misinformed about this bill. So I think hearing it from somebody that is pushing this bill in Harrisburg, there'd be no other, no better person to talk to than uh, John Galloway. So again, I want to thank everybody for being here, and we'll open the meeting up to John and his uh, staff. I want to introduce the superintendent of the school district, Mr. Greg Wright, our council vice president and school board president who's here and also school board members that are in attendance from Bristol Borough. And I noticed to my left we have some council members from Bristol Township also. I want to thank you for being here this evening. Thank you for having us. You're welcome. So hopefully this is the start of a town meeting that John can do throughout Bucks County and his district. And I'm sure he's going to be interested to hear what everybody has to say. So I'll turn the meeting over to him, which will be moderated this evening by Bill Pezza, who is the head of our Economic Development Committee here in Bristol Borough. So, John, again, thank you for being here. Hopefully we can clear up some questions that people may have this evening. Thank you, Ralph. Good evening. And welcome to this information meeting. And that's exactly what it is. This is an information meeting regarding the, pro the Property Tax Independence Act, commonly known as House Bill 76. When Representative Galloway asked me to moderate the meeting, I readily accepted because as chairman of the Economic Development Committee for Bristol Borough, uh, my primary concern is how this legislation would affect uh, home sales in Bristol and how it would affect funding for our school district. So um, uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Originally, I think uh, John's intention was to have a small information session where he was able to talk to, stay, uh, to uh, uh, elected officials, councilmen, uh, school board members, and whatnot, because they're the people to get the phone calls from their constituents who want to know answers, and, and, and he wanted them to be as informed as possible. This thing, uh, fortunately, this thing mushroomed. Uh, there's obviously a considerable amount of, uh, of interest, and uh, we're pleased with that. To uh, accommodate the growing number of people here, we uh, have an overflow crowd room down the hall. If some of you are standing, would like to sit, there, there are chairs in there, and there's a TV in there, and everything you see on the screen in this room will be shown in that room as well. Um, in addition to that, uh, this, this meeting is being telecast live to uh, the, our Comcast audience on channel 965. It will be played later on a recurring basis, as we're used to seeing of council meetings. And in addition to that, it will be posted on the borough web page so that citizens who don't have cable television can still uh, access it through, through the Internet. And finally, I believe the Bucks County Courier Times will be uh, streaming it as well. So uh, there are going to be plenty of opportunities for people who are on vacation or for shut-ins or whatever to, to uh, have the, uh, the chance to hear what's going on tonight. In terms of the procedure, uh, we're going to be finished at 8.30. That's because of the videotaping that's taking place. And, and uh, we're here to listen to the experts. I want to make sure uh, we make that very clear, okay? This is not a night for speeches. This is not a night for us to be venting our frustrations. We know what the problems here. That's why we're, what the problems are. That's why we're here. Public education costs a lot of money. Funding it through property taxes uh, seems to be something that bugs everybody. What we're here to do is to listen to the people, first of all, our own representative, who has been a sponsor of this bill and a supporter of this bill for three years, and prior to that supported a, a, a constitutional convention that would eliminate property taxes for, uh, for school districts and, and make sure that if this bill passes, no future legislature can revise the bill or change it without a constitutional amendment to do so. So uh, we're pleased to be able to hear from our own representative to talk to us about how this would affect our town. 
In addition, uh, David Baldinger, uh, another expert who is here. David is uh, from the Pennsylvania Taxpayers Cyber Coalition. And uh, I don't think there's too, ma too many people in the state more knowledgeable about what the bill is than these two. So uh, that's the way we're going to introduce it. So with that, let me introduce to you our state representative, John Galloway. John? Thank you, Billy. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all very much for being here today. I have some pre prepared remarks, um, and I'm going to go off of that a little bit and, and do something a little bit different. Uh, I met somebody here today who had given me a letter, uh, written me a letter not too long ago that uh, caught my eye, and he's here today. Uh, I believe Matt, is Matt here today? In, in a second, Matt, in a second. Um, I'm going to ask you to come up and just read what you wrote because uh, perhaps you could say it better than I could. But I do have some prepared remarks. First, I'd like to thank Council uh, for, for uh, providing the space, providing the time, uh, providing the resources, uh, everything we need to, to get the word out. It, it was, uh, you know, I approached, I've approached councils in all the different boroughs and municipalities for some time about this. I've held town meetings. Um, I've talked about it several several times, and Ralph DiGiuseppe and, and even Ralph Jr., who, who was on who's on the school board, um, had even come to Harrisburg and, and discussed this with me as well. And, and when I approached them a couple weeks ago about getting some time, uh, they gracious or Ralph and the council graciously gave me today. Um, I know the time's short and and, and, the, and it's kind of cramped. Um, but we'll do the best we can, and uh, if we got to do it again and again and again, we, we will. We'll do it in bigger places and bigger venues, but we're just going to keep the discussion going. Um, so I want to thank council. Um, I also want to thank the people, the elected officials are here. I, I know I'm probably not going to get to all of them, but it's good to see my friends from Bristol Township, uh, Amber, Craig, and Troy. Um, it's good to see my friends from my friend from Tullytown, uh, Marianne Gehagen. Um, it's also uh, Robin Trinnell, an old friend of mine, and, and Ralph DiGiuseppe Jr. I know I'm going to miss a couple people, but I, I, I appreciate you being here and um, and allowing me to uh, to bring this issue issue forward. I do have some prepared remarks. I, I had written an editorial in the Bucks County Courier Times today, and I'd like to read that. Hopefully, you guys have a copy of that. There's there's copies outside. Um, so excuse, excuse the prepared remarks, but I really wanted to share this particular editorial with you and what I had said. I talked about, I started off the editorial talking about when I was a kid and my influences in politics. And one of my biggest influences was Bobby Kennedy. And I love Bobby Kennedy. He was a big part of why I got involved in politics to begin with. He used to quote George Bernard Shaw all the time. And the quote was, some men see things as they are and ask why. And I dream of things that could be or never were and ask why not. He used that quote to show how much he cared. He cared for the poor, the sick, the elderly, and he was a champion for what he called America's greatest invention, which is the middle class. One of the first bills I started working on when I, after being sworn in almost eight years ago, was a constitutional convention to fundamentally change the way we fund our schools. I've always felt it's the greatest problem facing the middle class and senior citizens my district and this state. Pennsylvania's education system is crumbling. Harrisburg rewards larger growing school districts and penalizes smaller school districts like Bristol Borough. Children are treated differently based on their zip code. Harrisburg used to fund almost 50% of school costs in this state. Today it barely reaches 17%. And local homeowners are left holding the bag. This has occurred under both Democrats and Republicans. We pit school board members against teachers, against homeowners, against seniors. And our kids are caught in the middle while Harrisburg walks in between the raindrops. The problem isn't school boards or homeowners or teachers or seniors. And it sure isn't our kids. It's not our children. The problem is Harrisburg. 
A big, part of the, a big part of the solution is to move away from funding our schools with a local property tax and replacing it with an increase in state sales and income tax. Imagine a Bristol borough and a state where our kids are treated equally. Imagine homeowners no longer worrying about property taxes. Imagine the positive effects it would have on our property values, our economy, and our schools. HB 76 has been offered as a solution, and I applaud the sponsor, a Republican named Jim Cox from Berks County. We can argue for years about the specifics of the bill, but I've always seen it as a starting point. It's not whether you agree with everything in the bill. That's not the point. The point is whether you agree with the concept. If you agree there is a problem and the concept of a solution, because if you do, we can compromise. It's no longer about telling me and telling us supporters that you have a problem with page 400, line 27, and therefore you're not going to support the bill. If you do, we'll compromise. We'll fix it. Just rejecting the solution out of hand without stating whether you agree on the problem and the concept for a solution is not good enough anymore. I've reached across the aisle and worked with Republicans to address one of the most divisive issues of our time, illegal immigration. E-Verify for all public projects to the law of the land in Pennsylvania. I have a reputation in Harrisburg as somebody who can work across the aisle. Someone who can cut deals, who can compromise, who's working to put aside politics and get something done. I want to do it again. And it's time for education. People ask me why. I say, why not? I've often talked about the great silent majority in this state. And I believe that silent majority is sick and tired of politicians fighting and not accomplishing anything. The result is total gridlock. And both parties have forgotten about the middle class. For the first time since I've been in Harrisburg, there's a movement growing around this issue. I believe the silent majority is mobilizing around this issue. I'm asking them to join us. And Bobby Kennedy, to me, was a great man. If he were here today, he wouldn't look at the problem and ask why. He'd look for solutions and say, why not? Again, my name is Representative John Galloway. I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules and a beautiful summer day to come down here and talk about something I feel is very, very important to people in Bristol Borough, to the kids, not only of Bristol Borough, but to the Bristol Boroughs all over this state. Bristol Borough is not unique. There's more Bristol Boroughs than, than, than there aren't. It's, it's, it's a problem. It's a very, very serious problem. HB 76 is a very serious solution. It takes a lot of guts to put out a $10 billion bill. Our entire budget in Harrisburg is only $28 billion. This bill is a $10 billion bill. You could look at it all day long and find problems with it and say, I don't like this and I don't like that. But that's not why I'm here. I want to know if you recognize that we have a problem. A very serious problem. And a big part of the solution is moving away from property taxes. If you agree with that, I'll compromise with you on anything you want. You got a problem with line page 400, line 27, I'll compromise. I'll change it. We've got to get to the point where we agree. We need to do something and we need to do it now. This bill is so close to getting moved. We have almost 89, we have 89 co-sponsors. Uh, there's only 200 some representatives in Harrisburg. If we can get to that magic 100 mark, it's gonna be impossible for them to hold us back. Hold us back sooner rather than later. Maybe even September when we get called back. And that's why we're all gonna put, make a push. In Bucks County, for example, there's only two representatives, two elected officials that actually support HB 76. And perhaps the other ones have problems with parts of the bill, which is why I'm reaching out and trying to bring it to a higher level. 
It's not about parts of the bill that you have a problem with. The question is, do you recognize that there is a problem, and do you recognize that we've got to move forward with a solution? If you do, I'll compromise with you. Bucks County is huge. Bucks County is a big part of getting this bill out of committee and getting this run on the House floor. So again, I want to thank everybody for being here. Um, it's great to have David here. David is someone that I've relied on for a long time. All, a lot of us rely on the guy who puts in a tremendous amount of work getting the information out. Uh, in a bill this size, it's impossible to be an expert on everything. Um, you can read and read and read and, and, and still not understand everything as much as we try. Um, but a guy like David is an invaluable resource, and I'm so glad he's here today. He's going to give us a presentation, an overview of what HB 76 looks, at, looks like. Um, but from my standpoint, I'm trying to look out for, the, for Bristol Borough and the Bristol Boroughs all over the state. I want kids to be treated fairly. I want the burden taken off of homeowners. I want our economy to start taking off, and I want our property values to start increase. And a big part of that is HB 76. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Before I introduce David, I just want to reiterate the purpose of the meeting tonight is for information. Uh, you know, sometimes people <clears throat> reach their conclusions and then search for facts to fit them. And I think, obviously, the better way to do it is to find some facts and then draw conclusions at the end. So we're here tonight to listen to facts, listen to uh, points of view uh, expressed by David and John, take them home, digest them, submit our questions. Be, this, this is the beginning. It's a springboard of dialogue to get our questions answered. I'm sure John will grow from this experience as well, and uh, hopefully uh, what's, what's the outcome will be something that benefits all Pennsylvanians. So David Bollinger uh, is a uh, full-time volunteer taxpayer advocate from Berks County whose exclusive focus is the elimination of school property taxes and educational finance reform. He administers the Pennsylvania Taxpayer Cyber Coalition and is the founder and organizer of the Pennsylvania Coalition of Taxpayers Associations, a statewide alliance of 80 grassroots advocacy groups that are working as one for the elimination of school property taxes through, through the Property Tax Independent Act. It's my pleasure to introduce David Baldinger. Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for coming out tonight, and thank you, Representative Galloway, for inviting me to talk with you tonight. Just so you understand my involvement, took most of my took most of my introductions, so you understand my involvement in this. Representative Cox, the prime sponsor of the House bill, House Bill 76, agreed back in late 2010 to allow our Taxpayers Coalition to help craft this bill. I was the liaison for the taxpayer groups and worked very closely with Representative Cox in crafting this bill. And as I think Representative Galloway will tell you, it's very seldom that taxpayer groups have this kind of a voice in legislation in Harrisburg. We co-wrote this legislation. It is our bill, and we approve every section of it. So you understand where I'm coming from on this. So I'd like to start off, first of all, with a couple of numbers. I, I don't believe you can talk about a solution if you don't understand the problem. And I hear an awful lot of Harrisburg legislators say, oh, we need to give property tax relief. Well, if you hear property tax relief, you know they don't understand the problem. So let's talk about some of the problems first. Those numbers mean anything to anybody? $27 billion is the current total cost of K-12 education in Pennsylvania. The historical annual rate of increase is 6 and a quarter percent. If you use 10 years and 6 and a quarter percent as a constant and multiply it through, you'll find in 10 years the total cost of education in Pennsylvania will balloon to $53 billion. We've got to halt this now if we're going to survive. Here's another number for you. That's the number, that's the amount you can expect to see your property taxes increase in the next two, three, or four years for a number of reasons. The pension crisis and the funding of that fall off in the stock market, underpayments to the pension fund, increases from reduced basic education subsidy from the state. You could possibly see a 20 to 30 percent increase in your taxes over the next few years. How many of you can afford that? Come on, let me see a show of hands. Finally, 10,000. I'll give you a clue on this one. 
This is from the Reading Eagle, my hometown. Notice it says tax sale. These are not foreclosures. I have cuts like this from York County, Schuylkill County, all over the state. 1,100 homes are on this list to be sold at tax sale for non-payment of property taxes. And that doesn't include all the folks who sell their homes to avoid getting sheriff sales because they can't afford to pay the taxes. I'm going to give you some local numbers for Bucks County. Right now, Bucks County has 6,582 homes with tax liens on them. 17,630 homes in foreclosure. A lot of people have said to me, well, people who are in foreclosure for the most part, they got into their own problems because they bought too much house. And that may or may not be true, but the fact is, every time a house is foreclosed, it hurts your local economy, it hurts, of course, the people who lose the house, and it hurts the neighborhood where the house is foreclosed. Eliminating the greatest portion of the school property of the property taxes, the school property tax, can make a big difference in keeping people in their homes when they might otherwise be foreclosed. I mentioned a couple of other things too. I have a very friendly local taxpayer in Berks County. I always pay my school property taxes on the last day of the of the rebate period, so I can go in and have a chat with her. She told me this year that more people than ever have been having trouble paying the first property tax bill the county and municipal tax bill, which is smaller of the two. See, she said she has absolutely no idea how they're going to be able to afford the school property tax bill when it comes around right now. Further said, more people than ever have complained to her about having to take out home equity loans just to pay their property tax, or take a second mortgage on their house to pay their property tax, or have taken the installment plan to pay their property taxes. This is reaching crisis proportions. And I think there are a lot of folks in Harrisburg who don't quite understand this. But further, Fourth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution and Article I of the Pennsylvania Constitution both say basically the same thing. It, they guarantee that we will be secure in our property. Yet some of these same politicians who have taken an oath to uphold those constitutions will allow our homes to be seized for non-payment of property taxes. Not only is this property tax a burden on taxpayers, it is unconstitutional from that viewpoint because our homes can be seized. So, yes, we're talking about property taxes, but more we're talking about education finance reform. And myth number one, property taxes are the problem. Property taxes are only the symptom of a much lar larger problem. Property taxes are based on an antiquated funding system that began in the Middle Ages when only landowners had money, so they were taxed on their land because they were the only ones who were, could afford it. The serfs couldn't. We imported this into Pennsylvania in the early 1800s. At that time, we were an agrarian society. Most people earned their living from the land, and a farmer who was farming 40 acres was assumed to be making more money than a farmer who was farming 10 acres and was taxed accordingly based on the land bringing in their income. Why does it make any sense in this day and age to still tax our properties as if they're income producing? We live in our homes. We don't use them to generate income, but we're still taxed as if they do. Further, property taxes are inherently arbitrary and unfair. We went through a reassessment back in the late 1980s in Berks County. I've heard this story from all over the state about how almost identical homes side by side are assessed at different values during a reassessment. It happened with us. We live in a cookie-cutter development that was built in the mid-80s. All the houses are about the same square footage. All the lots are about the same size. Yet somehow, our neighbor's house was assessed at $40,000 less than ours. We appealed it, got a small reduction. But the point of it is, this is strictly a subjective procedure. There is nothing objective about it. There's no, no way to be totally fair. And even after a reassessment, home values change so rapidly, they still can't keep pace. Inability to pay property tax bills I already talked about, and that's a huge part of the problem. Out of control spending. Act 1, the famous legislation that brought you property tax relief from gambling, is also supposed to be able to limit increases in property taxes each year from the schools. Act 1 sets an index each year based on inflationary measures. The schools are not allowed to raise taxes above that measure, except they're allowed to apply to the Department of Education for an exception. Otherwise, it would have to go to a referendum. This year, 180 school districts in Pennsylvania applied for, for exception to the referendum. 
It was rubber stamped by the PDE. Almost 40% of the school districts in Pennsylvania raised their property taxes above the state mandated maximum without a referendum. We've seen some property tax increases statewide as high, in, as, high as 5 and 6%. Lack of effective education cost controls, education and taxation and equities. I just saw a piece last week that pointed this out. The Duquesne School District, I believe is in Allegheny County, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but the Duquesne School District receives over $12,000 per year per student from the basic education subsidy from the state. They're the number one school district in the state for the state subsidy. On the other hand, in Berks County, where I'm from, the Y Missing School District gets $600 per student. That's a huge disparity. Which school district would you rather live in? Thank you. I'll take Duquesne any day with the property taxes they must have based on the per pupil funding. But there's also the, another problem with the basic education funding formula that causes this. I'll give you two examples. The Berwick School District in Columbia County has lost 900 students in the past 10 years. At the same time, they've been able to hire 40 new teachers because they received the same relative amount of funding as they received in 1991. Despite the fact that they've lost 900 students, the money's still there and their property taxes are very low. Swap that over to the York Suburban School District in York County. They've had a huge influx of students over the past 20 years since the funding formula was developed. 89% of their school budget is financed through local property taxes. Their homeowners are getting killed. Another part of the problem with the system. And of course, the projected cost of education. There's the short answer. An irreparably broken K-12 public education finance system. And that's what we're look, looking at trying to fix. Myth number two. Property tax relief or property tax reform is the answer. How many of you like those Act I rebates from gambling money? How much has that helped you? Real property tax relief, I know what we were promised, doesn't matter. Fact is, property tax relief, there's been all sorts of proposals for property tax relief, at least three of them based on local tax shifting to a different form of tax. Act 50, Act 72, Act 1, all proposed local tax shifts. Act 50 and 72 at the discretion of local school boards was turned down overwhelmingly across the state. Act 1, if you remember, in 2007, there was a statewide referendum on whether to shift part of your property taxes to a local earned income tax. 494 or 498 eligible school districts rejected the shift to a local earned income tax. And following that referendum, Governor Rendell said that people were stupid for rejecting it. People weren't stupid. They, understo they, they understood the implications. Yes, you can shift part of your property taxes to another local source. But as long as you don't cap those property taxes, they're going to continue to rise until they're right back at the same level they were before, but with a new tax to pay. We heard it a couple of years ago in House Bill 1600. Wanted to raise the sales tax by a half point, the income tax by a quarter point, for about $400 in property tax reduction. Same situation. Property taxes go right back up again. Only two new taxes to pay this time. And again, this time in the House, we have House Bill 1189, that gives the school boards, at the school board's discretion, thank you, nothing is guaranteed, a choice of shifting to a mercantile tax, a gross, a gross sales tax on merchants, or a local earned income tax. Same situation again. The folks in Harrisburg are going to offer us this kind of proposal as property tax relief when we know it does nothing. And I ran a couple of rough numbers on that. I did it for the York Suburban School District because of the problems they're having. Their, their school taxes generate about $35 billion a year if they were to shift that to a local earned income tax to completely eliminate, their local earned income tax would be better than 7%. For a family earning $50,000 a year, that increase would mean an additional $3,600 a year in taxes to get rid of the property tax. Local tax shifts don't work. Well, I already talked about them. I can skip this slide. Thank you. There's our mantra. No relief, no reform, no reduction, replace the school property tax, drive a stake through it, and end it forever. Get rid of this onerous tax. I'll give you a second to look at that. That poor guy's been sitting there for 30 years. 
That's how long we've been hearing about property tax relief and property tax reform, and nothing has come out of Harrisburg that makes any difference. Legislators have told us this is a complex issue that's not easily resolved. I'm sorry. To us as taxpayers, this is more than a, nothing more than a whiny excuse to absolve them from taking effective action, and it's totally untrue. They need courage and political will to do what is right, ignore the special interests, and do what is right for the people who elected them and get rid of this property tax. They also say taxpayers won't accept the massive change that we're talking about. We have over 60,000 known supporters in the state, and how many more we don't know about who follow us on the web and on Facebook. And all of them say the same thing. They don't care about shifting to other taxes as long as the tax that it replaces is totally eliminated. They don't care about shifting to sales and income tax as long as you get rid of the property tax. As Representative Galloway said, the lawmakers have got to stop nitpicking this legislation. Get behind the concept, work for compromise if there's something in particular you don't like, but get it done. We're tired of hearing the excuses, I don't like this line in the bill, so I can't support it. Nonsense. Support the legislation and work to get it done. So why is, the, why is now the time for change? First of all, rising homeowner discontent. You're proof of this tonight or you wouldn't be here. The failures of Act 50, Act 72, and Act 1. The last time Quinnipiac Polling Institute, they're from Massachusetts, last time they polled the state on property taxes was 2008. They poll the state regularly on political matters. That's their latest number. At that time, 89% of, of all property owners surveyed said that they felt the problem was urgent and needed to be addressed now, and that was five years ago. The Allegheny, Count Court, uh, the Allegheny County Court ruling, I'm not going to get too deeply into it, but what it amounted to was <coughs> Some homeowners in Allegheny County filed a lawsuit against the county saying they hadn't been reassessed soon enough that the property values were out of whack. They forced a reassessment in Allegheny County. Judge Stanton Weddick in Allegheny County ruled on it, felt they were right. It was eventually upheld in the state Supreme Court. And if you want to uphold the letter of Judge Weddick's decision, it would require a countywide reassessment every three to four years to keep home values straight. On average, a countywide reassessment in Pennsylvania costs $10 million. You'll pay for that through increased county property taxes to have a reassessment that's trying to fix a system that can't be fixed. It's absolute madness. Pressure from taxpayers groups in the media. A little over 18 months ago, PCTA was 32 groups. We are now 80. The media. In particular, and I'll, I'll name these folks because they've done such a great job, Mary Young at the Reading Eagle, Stan Husky at the Norris Town Herald, and Tony Ferrellis at the Town Mercury have been beating this drum for weeks with editorials pushing the lawmakers in Harrisburg to do something about it. We are getting more and more media attention. But probably the worst problem, when I started working on this back in 2004, the total amount of school property taxes we were trying to eliminate was $8 billion. That number is now 12.7. It has grown by 50% in just under 10 years. And in 2004, the plan was to pretty much tax everything with the sales tax, but reduce the rate to 4%, and it would have completely eliminated the property taxes at that time. Now, we've had to put together a number of taxes to make it work and to make sure that the rates don't go too high, but if property taxes keep increasing at their current pace, <coughs> we are going to outstrip the ability of the state to replace them from the state level. We've got to get this done now. We go on another two or three years, we're not going to be able to raise revenue at the state level without going to exceedingly high replacement taxes. March 2013, first quarter analysis from the Arizona State University. This is job growth rankings. Pennsylvania was 49th of 50 in job growth, only one of two states with negative job growth at minus 1.8%. And there's a reason I'm talking about that. Here's the second one. The March 2012, they haven't released the new one yet, Tax Foundation Comparative Analysis of Costs on Business. Pennsylvania was 49th of 50 for new firms, probably because of Keystone Opportunity Zones, which I'll get to, and 50th of 50 for mature established firms. Anybody know what the single largest business in Pennsylvania is? Largest industry in Pennsylvania? Farming. 
farming. I've given this talk in many places in the past few years, and I met a woman a few months ago in Monroe County. She told me, told me that 10 years ago her father was farming 40 acres of Christmas trees. Now he's farming fewer than 10, because in the intervening years he has sold off his property piece by piece, acre by acre, to, to be able to afford the property taxes. He's by far not unique. Many farmers in the state, and we're not talking about huge agribusinesses like Archer Daniels Midland. We're talking about family farms that have been in, been in families for generations are being sold off piecemeal so to afford the property taxes. The single biggest industry in Pennsylvania is being decimated by the property tax, along with not attracting business to this state. There's the solution. Replace the school property tax with a more broad-based and equitable funding system. The burden of financing schools in Pennsylvania today falls basically on homeowners. Yes, renters do pay property taxes in their rent, but by proportion, homeowners pay far more for the size of the property. There's only one proposal that we, as the Pennsylvania Coalition of Taxpayers, support, and that's House Bill 76 and Senate Bill 76, the Property Tax Independence Act. House Bill 76, prime sponsor is Representative Jim Cox from, uh, from the Reading area. Prime sponsors on Senate Bill 76 are David Argall, John Udichak, Judy Schwank, sorry, I had to think about that, and Mike Fulmer. Two Republicans, two Democrats as prime sponsors on Senate Bill 76, which says something about how this bill is viewed by both sides of the aisle. Let's take a look at it. We've looked at some basics when we were crafting the bill. First of all, total elimination of the school property tax forever, finding a different way to fund the schools. Total elimination to be phased in over a two-year period. First year, freeze taxes at the current level. Second year, goes away completely, with one exception that I'll explain in a minute. Total elimination of school board taxing ability for property taxes with a specific exception, which again I'll explain in a moment. Stabilization of school funding, and I want to ex expand on that for a second. It's conventional wisdom that property taxes are the most stable form of taxation. And I guess to an extent that's true. When somebody's holding a gun to your head, you're going to do whatever you have to do. And in this case, someone, someone told me a story just before we started tonight. Just raise your hand about the, about the woman with the, with the food and the, and the sure. property. That's a story that I've heard so many times about an older woman who has her food, her medications, and her property tax. She can't afford all three. It's not an exaggeration to say that many seniors are living on a minimum of food, and I've heard about so many of them who split pills or take half doses just to be able to come up with the money to afford the property taxes to keep from being thrown out of their homes. <clears throat> Stabilization of school funding, I, I, I started to talk about that and got off, uh, got off topic with that. Upper Marion School District in Montgomery County, and this is one example of many. Back in 2008, GlaxoSmithKline, that operates a huge manufacturing facility in Upper Marion, appealed its property tax assessment. It took two years to get through the courts. In the end, GlaxoSmithKline won was an immediate $2 million reduction in revenue to Upper Marion School District. What made that one particularly onerous was the fact that because it was in the courts for two years, the school district had to rebate the previous two years to GlaxoSmithKline an additional $4 million on top of it. But property tax reassessments are killing school budgets. We've seen it all over the state. Businesses especially do it, but homeowners are smart enough too to say, hey, the 2008 housing town turn, my house isn't worth what it was before. I'm going to appeal my assessment. And down goes the revenue to the school district. So when that happens, everybody else's property taxes go up to meet the shortfall. Establish realistic limits on K-12 education spending. And I'll explain in a little bit how we do that. <coughs> okay, the revenue side. First of all, we said the elimination swap must be absolutely tax revenue neutral for two reasons. First of all, it's the right thing to do. But second, Governor Corbett signed the Americans for Tax Reform No Tax Increase Pledge. If this raises more money than is necessary to eliminate the property tax, he won't sign it. He has said now on five occasions, if the bill reaches his desk and is tax revenue neutral, he will sign the bill. So that's one of the three hurdles overcome, hopefully. 
moderately expand the sales tax base to include more items and services. This is why this particular bill works so well in Pennsylvania. Representative Galloway asked me before we started tonight what other states have done this. The school financing in states is a hodgepodge. Everybody finances differently. M Michigan, in the mid-1990s, eliminated their, their, school pro or their property taxes completely. Unfortunately, it was a political maneuver trying to embarrass the governor who signed the bill that the legislature didn't expect them to sign, and they had no funding method in place. But what makes this bill work in Pennsylvania is that we have the narrowest sales tax base of any state in the country. To the most powerful revenue generator in House Bill and Senate Bill 76 is the expansion of that sales tax base to cover more items and particularly services, which we don't tax at all and most states do. This expansion of the sales tax base will bring us in line with just about every other state. We know it's going to happen eventually. Governor Rendell tried to do it a few years ago to raise money for the general fund. We know eventually it's going to happen in the legislature, so let's get it done now and put it to a good purpose and get rid of the school property tax. Included in the expanded base, gum, candy, magazines, and haircuts. Food is on the list, but any food that is on the, on the WIC list, women, infants, and children, that's a, a list of, it's, it's a federally approved list that's administered at the state level of nutritionally sound food. No added adulterants, no added sugar, that sort of thing. That's completely exempt, as are food stamp purchases. Clothing is also on the list, but only individual items of clothing with a value of more than $50. So if you've got to have the $150 Nikes, well, you're going to pay sales tax on it. If you're happy with the polo shirts that cost you 20 bucks, no, there's not going to be any sales tax on that. Exempted from the, from the sales tax will be food stamp purchases, all utilities, all home heating fuels, <coughs> tuition, health, hospital, and dental services, prescription drugs, and home health care. No sales tax on any of those. When you look at the list of things that are going to be subject to the sales tax, there's an instinctive objection. The one that I always get is, oh, you shouldn't tax food. Okay, let's get rid of the instinct for a moment and look at the numbers. If your school property tax is $3,500 a year, which, by the way, is the statewide average, divide that by 0 .07, which is going to be the new sales tax rate. I think that's the next bullet on here. Divide $3,500 by 0 .07 or your school property tax by 0 .07 to see how much you would have to spend on newly taxed items and services to equal the amount of property tax that was eliminated. In the case of the $3,500 example, divide by 0 .07 and you'll find you'd have to spend $50,000 on newly taxed items and services to equal the amount of tax paid in property taxes. Considering that, get rid of the instinctive objection, consider considered in that frame of, of, of reference, does it really matter what's subject to the sales tax? The rate goes to 7% from the current 6%. And the personal income tax goes to 4.2% up from the current 3.07. That's an increase of 1.27% or about a penny and a quarter on the dollar. Now, uh, the Act 1 gambling revenue that, you currently, that is currently um, allocated to property tax relief for those great rebates you get every year, that goes into the pot too. It's about $500 million and is really a very small part of the funding, but it's there nonetheless. <clears throat> now, the small retained property tax. This was a problem from the get-go. Um, debt service payments statewide total about $2.3 $2 billion a year. When we were looking at funding this plan, we said, wow, that's going to push us well over $12 billion. How can we manage to do this? It would have taken, first of all, to fund out about a 5% income tax rate. Not going to happen. It is not politically viable. I said, how else can we do this? And we looked at, at, at uh, North Dakota, who had a plan last year to, win, um, to eliminate their, their property taxes. What North Dakota did was, sa was said was leave the debt for each school district with that school district to service. On average, in Pennsylvania, school districts pay about 10% of their budget in debt service. That means in year two, for most districts in the state, they will see a 90% reduction in property taxes with the remaining 10% going away when that debt is satisfied. It only applies to debt that was on the books as of December 31st, 2012, so school districts can't load up on debt now in anticipation of the bill's passage. We found 22 school districts across the state with no long-term debt, and they will see complete elimination in year two. The highest we found was 18% in one school district.
but on average, about 10% of a school budget goes to debt service, and yes, there will be that much property tax remaining. But it solved two problems. First of all, we didn't have to find $2.3 billion at the state level with higher taxes. But second, during previous iterations of this bill going back to 2004, the debt was serviced from the state level. And a lot of district, a lot of folks who lived in frugal school districts rightfully complained. They said, why should I have to pay higher state level taxes to pay for the excesses of school districts who spent too much and are carrying too much debt? And I think that's really a good argument. So this solved both problems, where to find the money and satisfy that objection from folks who didn't want to pay extra state level taxes. All property tax replacement revenue goes into the Education Stabilization Fund, the lockbox account. And I get groans every time I say it because someone always brings up Social Security and how that lockbox account was raided. It's the best that can be done to guarantee that the money is segregated from the general fund. Although, if you compare what's happening in Pennsylvania to what's happening on the federal level, federal level, yeah, they can raise Social Security and then borrow to meet the shortfall. Pennsylvania can't do that. We must have a balanced budget. We can't borrow to meet that money. So the, the Education Stabilization Fund being raided is pretty unlikely. But still, it's the best we could do to try to keep the money segregated. Something else, and it was interesting, I gave this talk a couple of weeks ago, and somebody said to me, you know, this, this proves that this was written by taxpayers and not people in Harrisburg. Because one of the provisions in the bill is that if the Education Stabilization Fund exceeds 6% of the total revenue needed to replace the property tax, it triggers an automatic decrease in the income tax. This person mentioned to me, he said, you know, if this was written in Harrisburg, they just keep the extra money. Well, we don't do that. Now, replacement funding to the schools. This is probably the most contentious of all the issues in the bill. Representative Cox talked to a number of his colleagues, a large number of his colleagues on the floor, about how the funding to the school should be handled. And for each one he talked to, everyone had a different idea. We know how messed up the basic education funding formula is. Do we really want to get into that again? And what almost everybody agreed to, and what we found to be the fairest, was to reimburse the schools dollar for dollar for every dollar they've lost in property taxes. They lose $3 million in property taxes, they get $3 million back from the replacement revenue. There is no funding formula, there's no redistribution of wealth, it's strictly dollar for dollar replacement. Annual funding increases, and there are those who keep saying, oh, well, you've got to control the costs. And I agree, you have to control the costs. This is built into the bill. The annual increases from the state in this revenue cannot exceed either the increase in the consumer price index, which is a measure of infl inflation, the CPI, or available funding, whichever is less. Basically, it's saying dollars in, dollars out, with an inflationary riser. This keeps school district budgets, at least from this portion of the funding, in check with inflation. So you're not going to see those six and a quarter percent increases anymore. It has a lot of effect on how school districts are going to have to budget, but they're going to have to learn to live within a budget just the same way as the rest of us do. All right, that's funding. Okay, we agree that you can't leave the school district twisting in the wind. There is going to be a legitimate need for extra funding. School needs a new roof. You have increased population, need a new school. The school boards will be allowed to impose either a local earned income tax or personal income tax, but by local <coughs> referendum only. If it's for a specific project, like a new school, the, re the referendum has to state the name of the project, the cost of the project, the tax rate to be imposed, and a sunset date for the tax. It has to be put to the taxpayers. If it's for ongoing expenses, Fine, they'll be allowed to do that too, but again, only by referendum that has to be refreshed every four years. So once it's granted, they can't keep that increase forever. We think it's a fair way for school districts to be allowed to raise extra revenue when they need it. And this also addresses the, probably the biggest argument we hear the, about the bill, the loss of local control. There is no loss of local control. There are no, no mandates in the bill. School districts can do with the funding whatever they wish. And talk about local control, right now any five school board members can vote to raise your taxes at will. 
This takes it to the taxpayers. Isn't that the essence of local control? We didn't want to mess with basic education funding formula. Earlier versions of legislation combined all the funding into one big pop, including the basic education subsidy. It caused far too much conjecture and eventually killed the bill. We want to see this bill passed. There are those legislators in Harrisburg who like to fiddle with the basic education formula. We've heard the stories about how people feel that a lot of the money goes to Philadelphia or to Pittsburgh because there are favored legislators who are able to do that. We said, okay, if that's the objection, we keep this totally segregated from the basic education subsidy, let the legislature do with that as they wish. But this keeps everything segregated. Introduction of a separate constitutional amendment to forever prohibit using property taxes as a method of funding our schools. HB <laughs> HB and SB 76 will be enacted by statute. Anything enacted by statute can be unenacted the same way. Once it's written into the Constitution, it makes it far more difficult to change it. And this is why the Constitutional Amendment goes with the bill. Now, last year when the bill was introduced, now let me just tell you a minute how we put the funding together. When Jim Cox and I were working on it, we had two sources of numbers. The governor's uh, budget book for 2011-2012 and the best numbers we could get from the House Appropriations Committee. We always knew they probably weren't totally accurate, but they were the best numbers we had and we put them together in good faith. The Pennsylvania Independent Fiscal Office ran a study on it that was released on September 25, 2012 and found the bill fell $1.509 billion short of fully funding the schools. This has been used as a weapon by legislators who oppose the, uh, who oppose the bill, saying, oh, it doesn't fully fund the, f fund the schools. That is such a terrible excuse, because the IFO report should have been used as a tool, which we did, to adjust the funding in HB 76. It was a roadmap for us to get the funding right, and we adjusted the funding in HB 76 to make sure it's on the nose. There's another IFO report coming out in the fall. We are absolutely certain that it's going to verify what we're saying. If you hear any lawmaker object to the bill because they say it, it, it doesn't cover school funding, they're using it as an excuse, not a reason. We are in full conformance with the IFO report. And since we're on the IFO report, those who don't like the legislation like to use it as a weapon, but somehow they always miss some of the things that were in the back end of the report. And this report was 80 pages. It was tremendously comprehensive. I'm sure you've seen it. Tremendously comprehensive report. These are some of the things they said. The elimination of school property taxes increases the disposable income of property taxpayers. It assumes that 70% of the property tax cut goes to individuals, and that's roughly the split, 70% for individuals, 30% for businesses. It further assumes that homeowners spend 90% of the increase in disposable income. Roughly $12 billion in property taxes, 70% of that. We're looking at what? About $8 billion pumped right back into Pennsylvania's economy. Washington borrows money for stimulus. We have $8 billion waiting to go back into Pennsylvania's economy. People are going to go out and spend that money. You have $4,000 in property taxes stuck back, stuck back in your pocket every year. What are you going to do with it? You're going to go out and buy a new TV, a new car, something. Do improvements to your home, which, by the way, a lot of people won't do now, because if you improve your home, the assessor will come out and increase the taxes on it. This, give, this list lets you keep your own money and spend it as you wish, which is going to give you a boost to Pennsylvania's economy. The analysis indicates the legislation will cause home values to increase, on average, by 10% statewide. This restores a huge chunk of the loss that we experienced the two, during the 2008 downturn. Did you know every time property taxes go up, you lose equity in your home? I'll give you a quick example. Monroe County in the Poconos. A home on the market right now for $200,000 in the Poconos. $200,000 is a statewide average right now. A home for sale on the, on the market in Monroe County at $200,000, it's not unusual for them to have a $10,000 a year property tax load. What it does to the value of that home, they can't give their homes away. 
They have 3,000 homes in Monroe County right now that were strictly walkaways. People couldn't afford it anymore. They just took off. They're generating no property taxes, and nobody wants to buy them. With a $10,000 property tax load right now, and knowing it's going to go up further in the future, I wouldn't want to buy into a house like that. Those houses are practically worthless, and the same thing happens all over the state. Every time your property taxes go up, equity is stolen from your house. Working-age homeowners realize a tax cut. The analysis finds that the increase in federal income tax, because if you're an itemizer, you're not going to be able to deduct the property tax anymore. The uh, increase in federal income tax to lower itemized deductions, the increase in state income tax and sales tax is more than offset by the reduction in property taxes. And I have page numbers there if you want to reference these. Retired homeowners realize a significant reduction in taxes. The analysis finds that the property tax reduction easily offsets any increase from the sales tax. The elimination of property taxes would significantly reduce the property tax share, and this is the one I love, would significantly reduce the property tax share and would clearly increase the attractiveness of the Commonwealth for business, location, and expansion. Remember the numbers I gave you earlier, minus 1.8% job growth? We could be huge with this. Anybody know what a KOZ is? Yep. yep. KOZ, Keystone Opportunity Zone. Targeted tax abatements to attract businesses to Pennsylvania. For my area, Cabela's is probably the best known one in my area. Ten-year abatement, they came right in, built the place, and have a lot of development around it. Now, on the other hand, EA Games did, uh, took an abatement like this about 15 years ago in Chester County. They moved in, took their ten-year abatement. Ten years to the day when the abatement ran out, EA Games moved out of state. With KOZs, we allow others to pick and choose who the winners and losers are going to be. Why not get rid of the property tax and then make the entire state a KOZ? Well, <laughs> welcome businesses to Pennsylvania and the jobs they create and help build this state's economy rather than tearing it down with our tax structure. And we know the tax structure is the largest reason why businesses do not want to locate here. <clears throat> Benefits would also accrue to home builders, home developers, and other landowners who would convert current land holdings into new housing plots, and this would increase employment in the construction sector as well. And regarding business entities, and I, I hear the argument all the time, we should eliminate for homeowners and not for businesses. Okay, I think I've just proven to you one good reason why we should eliminate for businesses. Second, because of the uniformity clause of the Pennsylvania Constitution, you cannot have different rates of taxation on homeowners and, ta and, and businesses. In order to do that would require a constitutional amendment. You're looking at a minimum two-year process to get that done and no guarantee of success. We cannot afford to mess around with a constitutional amendment to try to split this taxation. There are benefits to eliminating for businesses as well as homeowners. Let's just get it done now. Anyway, regarding business entities, the income flows through to individuals as higher disposable income. For past two entities, the analysis assumes owners and shareholders spend 90% of the increase, 70% is spent on taxable goods and services yielding another secondary effect of $34 million in increased sales taxes for fiscal year 2013-14. This feeds on itself. You get the money back in your pocket, you go out and spend it, and this generates more sales tax. Talk about funding education. This is absolutely a no-brainer. Not only does it remove the burden of the property tax from the homeowner, it generates job for jobs for Pennsylvania, it attracts businesses for Pennsylvania, and helps to grow our economy. Why could you possibly object to getting this done? I started on this in the beginning, I'll reiterate it. This is the people's bill. This is our legislation. We had a hand in every part of this legislation. We approved all of it. Our suggestions were incorporated. And what's amazing about our 80-member coalition, we're not politically divided. We have folks on both ends of the political spectrum. We've done something that Washington and Harrisburg has been unable to do. We've come together on an issue and come to agreement on trying to solve a problem rather than this political polarization we see all the time. We have come from both ends of the spectrum to get this bill done, and we believe it works, and we are united behind it. Here's the current, uh, here's the current situation. House bill has 89 co-sponsors, 53 Republicans, 36 Democrats, a 60-40 split. In the Senate, 22 co-sponsors, 12 Republicans, 
10 Democrats for a 55-45 split. That is tremendous bipartisanship. You what we're shooting for, I speak plainly. I have no political affiliation when it comes to this issue. The bill is being held up in the House Finance Committee. We think it's being pushed, uh, uh, being held up by the, by the GOP leadership who controls the House. What we're looking for is to increase that 89 to 102, which is a clear majority in the House of Representatives. Doesn't guarantee the bill will come out and hit the floor, but with 102 co-sponsors, a majority, it makes it very difficult for the House leadership to be able to give a reason why they won't allow the bill to the floor. If you have the chance, obviously it doesn't matter if you call Representative Galloway because he's with us on this and always has been. But what you can do is spread the word to your friends across the state and let them know if their representative isn't co-sponsoring this, find out why. And tell them, tell them to call the representative and let them know, we want you to co-sponsor this bill. If we can reach 102, we're going to be golden, I think. The Senate side, the prime sponsors have been working very hard to bring more senators on board. <coughs> They're guesstimating by September when the legislature reconvenes, we are going to have an excess of 26, which would be a majority in the Senate, and would, again, pretty much force the leadership to run the bill, although we don't see the opposition in the Senate that we see in the House. <coughs> Most of all, this is a clean bill. I've heard jokes that special interests and lobbyists will come in and pop their feet up on a legislator's desk and dictate legislation to them. It's a joke, obviously. The fact is, the special interests have a whole lot of influence in how bills are written and what's contained in those bills. So do some lawmakers who want to see special perks for their districts written into the bills. Because of our involvement in this bill, this bill is absolutely clean. There is nothing in it to benefit anyone except the taxpayers and the school children of Pennsylvania. We made sure this bill was clean. Not saying it can't happen through amendment as it passes through the legislative process, but right now, there is nothing in here to benefit any special interests. Quick look at the, the common objections. Numbers don't work. I already addressed that. Lock, loss of local control. Talked about that, too. There's no loss of local control. <clears throat> we shouldn't tax clothing, books, flags, whatever. Same thing. I explained that to you. <clears throat> and the plan shouldn't eliminate for businesses. I think we talked about that, too. A lot of times when I've given this talk, folks have said to me, hope that they'll do something about it. Or good luck. I hope you can do it. Look, if you leave it to them, meaning the folks in Harrisburg, they're not going to do anything about it. This is massive change. And just inertia is enough to keep them from stopping it. They're afraid of this kind of change. This is not something Harrisburg is going to do on its own. It's going to take us, the grassroots, to get it done to get behind the lawmakers like Representative Galloway who support it and support him, but to get behind those who don't support it and get them on the bill. Right now in Bucks County, you have three legislators who are on the bill. Here in Lower Bucks, Representative Galloway, Representative Tina Davis, Upper Bucks, Representative Paul Clymer. None of the other Bucks representatives are on this bill. They need to be told it's time for you to get behind this bill. We, we know it's a disgrace. No. Yeah. Um, it, it, you've got to call them and let them know you expect them to get behind this bill if you want to see it, they want to get it done. And good luck. I hope you can do it. I can't do anything. People have asked me about my role. I like to say I'm a facilitator. I like to help to motivate others to join in the fight. And that's what we need from you tonight. We need you to get involved in this. It's a grassroots effort. We have to push. It's not a top-down effort. It's bottom-up. It's us. We are government, and we are the ones who have to make this happen. And that's why I go out and give these talks. I gave more than 50 of these last year, all for the same reason, to gain support for this bill and get the grassroots activated and working for the bill. That's us. We're the grassroots working for the bill. This is in the Pottstown Mercury last year. Notice we have the governor and the legislature and Pennsylvania Coalition of Taxpayer Association telling them we want to see this done. We can do it with your help. And please, if you agree with what you've heard tonight, we'd like you to become active and do what you can. There's the web address, ptcc.us. There are handouts on the table out there on the foyer that explain the Property Tax Independence Act in brief, plus 10 reasons to eliminate the property tax. The web address is on there. 
I invite you to come to the website, take a look at the information there. There's a tremendous amount of supporting information. Uh, the, a video of the talk I gave tonight is also there. We are also very active on our Facebook page. Property Tax Independence Act page currently has about 1,200 likes. The, pro the PTCC page uh, has more than 1,900 participants right now, and it's very active with a lot of discussion. So if you're on Facebook, I invite you to come over to the PTCC page and join. And one more thing. If you go to the website, there's a link there for email updates. Please subscribe. All I need is an email address, no other personal information. I will not spam your inbox. I only send out updates when it's necessary for action items, things you can do to help. So please, get involved, go to the website. <coughs> you, can, you can send questions to Representative Galloway. There's a contact. Let me, uh, I'm going to expand on that. And right let, let me thank David for a very passionate and comprehensive <coughs> and very clear. As for the questions, as I explained earlier in the meeting, um, this is a chore, especially with the time we have remaining, but uh, many of the questions that, that <coughs> I have collected here have been answered in that comprehensive report. I'm going to try to, uh, we, we got the questions from three sources. One, uh, as the paper indicated, people were able to send their questions in uh, online in advance to Representative Galloway's office, and I have a list of them here. Many have been answered, but I'm going to try to uh, resurface them anyway. And in addition, you guys submitted questions on these uh, index cards. And one reason why we're doing that is because there's people in the other room who submitted them on index cards too. They wouldn't be able to ask them if they if we didn't do it this way. So, um, uh, first question. Uh, John, you have anything to add before I uh, go Yes, these? yes, please. please. And I appreciate that. First of all, David, thank you very much. I've heard that uh, presentation done several times, updated each time. Um, it's a tremendous amount of information and a tremendous amount of work uh, that he takes time out of his life to do, and, and um, I appreciate it very much. First of all, I knew I was going to miss some people, and I'm probably going to continue to miss some people, but my good friend, Supervisor Bob Harvey from Falls Township is here, and I want to say hello and thank you for being here as well. Um, I've already received hundreds of questions. Um, as, I, as I stated, when I first started this six, seven years ago, I got two people to come to my first town hall. Um, and it's grown. It's grown and grown and grown and, and just exploded recently. Uh, and when it came out in the newspaper and we went on social media, you know, I literally got hundreds of questions. I also have... Uh, there's going to be more questions today. We, we're handing out index cards. If you got questions, get them to me. Uh, give me a contact so I can get back to you. Uh, there's Twitter. There's Facebook. There's social media. If you want to do it the old-fashioned way, stop in my office. Give me a call. Uh, Gallus is there all the time. Who knows how to do it? I, I'll, I'll take all summer if I have to. I'll, I'll answer every one of these questions. There's literally, I know there's going to be hundreds and hundreds of questions. Um, but I'll take all summer. I'll take the rest of the summer, and, and, and we'll get as many questions to you as possible, many answers to your questions as possible. But let's let's start tonight by just taking some of the some of the ones we already have. Let's take a break. Um, get all your questions to me, and uh, I'll get back to you as soon as possible. Tomorrow afternoon, from 12 to 2, we're going to be doing an online session. Um, and then from there on out, just give me a call. Stop by my office, give me a call, go on my Facebook, go on my web page, do it through social media, do it the old-fashioned way, and, and I promise I'll get back to you as soon as I can. All right? Thanks, Billy. Okay. Appreciate so, it. On the screen are the uh, avenues you can pursue to uh, submit those questions. I want to add, and I apologize to Bucks Local News. Uh, we got theirs later, but uh, you can also send your questions to buckslocalnews.com in care of Jeff Werner. And uh, Jeff will post the questions, and then Representative Galloway will be able to respond to them. Sure. I, I, I uh, apologize, Billy. I did have one thing that's kind of off the agenda, if, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, like I said, I, I've received literally hundreds of emails. I, I receive thousands and thousands of emails each, each year on, on all kinds of different issues from people all over the state. Um, one, I remember reading late at night. It was from a guy named Matt 
but Bashel is it? Bashel. Um, <clears throat> the guys remember the Pensbury Taxpayer Cyber Coalition and the Lower Bucks County Taxpayers Association. You know, sometimes you read emails and you read things that just break your heart or, or, or really grab your attention. And um, this one was this one was good. This one was different. Um, and if you don't mind, I, I'd like I'd like Matt to come up and, and read your email to and because I, I really think it's important. I think it adds to the discussion. So, Matt, if you could come up and, and read this for me, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> Uh, thank you for letting me speak. And um, like I said, my name's Matt Bushell, and I'm a member of the Pennsylvania Taxpayer Cyber Coalition, and I'm a member of the Lower Bucks County Taxpayers Association. And I'd like to thank Representative Galloway uh, for hosting this event, um, Representative Jim Cox for drafting the legislation, David Baldinger for his tireless efforts in supporting the legislation. Our other Bucks County co-sponsors, namely Tina Davis, Paul Clymer, as well as the rest of the 89 House co-sponsors. I'd like to thank Senator David Argel for sponsoring the companion legislation in the Senate, SB 76, which has 23 co-sponsors. And it only needs 26 yes votes to pass. And I'd like to thank David DeLong from the Bristol Borough Taxpayers Association. We're only right around the corner from each other. We need to work together. Uh, now I'd like to tell you a story about a young couple named Don and Liz. Uh, Don and Liz were freshly married with a young family of three, a boy and two girls. Uh, they rented a row home in Philadelphia on Oriana Street, if anybody knows where that is. And one day they came down Route 1 for a day in Bucks County and stopped to look at the aquarium at the realtor's office. And the real, realtor came out for a chat and he said, are you a veteran? And Don said, yeah, Navy. And the realtor said, well, I got a deal for you. And with a $100 down payment, Don and Liz bought their home in Levittown. And it was a jubilee. They had a front and backyard and two bathrooms, apple tree. And Don would remark it was a real palace. Don and Liz both worked. He was in a division of Goodyear that ran the automotive departments at Wilco, if anybody remembers Wilco. And Liz worked at the vault in Bamberger's, if anybody remembers Bamberger's. Uh, later they would have a fourth child, a boy, and uh, would plant roots in the home for years to come. Now, Don and Liz, they faced a lot of adversity uh, and some very tough times. Uh, Wilco went out of business, and Goodyear shut down the division he managed. And the belts got tight. A lot of no frills and fried bologna and baked bean dinners. And a lot of winners without oil. But through it all, the family survived, and the mortgage was paid. And Don and Liz. Um, their family survived, the children grew up and married and had families of their own, and eventually the mortgage was paid off. And Don and Liz, they had saved the best that they could and continued working well into retirement because they couldn't afford to quit with those ever-present property school taxes. And one day, Liz got sick. It was a brain tumor. And uh, Don's light died two months later. And then the market crashed. And he lost half his money and his savings. Then he lost his job. This all happened in a year. His son sat at the kitchen table with him. And uh, 
figured a year or two he'd be able to stay, but he'd have to sell in a down market with little chance of selling. But not long after that, Don got aggressive leukemia. And he said, the way he did, well, if you're going to get wet, you might as well go swimming. And he lived six months longer than they gave him. But then he died. But the house remained. The house that was paid for, the house that they worked for. But the tax bill was there, and the kids didn't have the money. Through sheer determination, many good friends that helped, the kids managed to keep the house, and another young family lives there now, hoping to buy it soon. They can't afford it at the moment. Don and Liz, my parents, you and me, your parents, we are here because the funding mechanism for education is broken. We are here because of the tens of thousands of sheriff sales in Pennsylvania. We are here because of the one billion dollars in property tax liens in Pennsylvania. We are here to ensure that a more stable funding mechanism ensures a quality education continues for our children. We are here to expand the tax base so not just one-third of Pennsylvanians support education, but all of us do. We are here to support a bill that will boost the economy of all Pennsylvania and create jobs. We are here, and we won't stop. Now, the naysayers will say nay, but David and the Independent Fiscal Office will and have proved them wrong. We need Senator Tomlinson. We need Chuck McElhaney. We need Dean DiGirolamo, Frank Farry, Kathy Watson. We need them all. This isn't about seniors. As much as one-third to one-half of a 30-year monthly mortgage payment is to pay property tax. In tough times, yeah, you can cut back. No frills and bologna and baked bean dinners. But you can't not pay your taxes, and they will take your home. And that $700 a month in escrow could be the difference of staying in your home, as David said earlier. We're here, and our motto is, no tax should have the power to leave you homeless. Call them, write letters, get to the new <clears throat> table. This means a lot to me, because I had to sit at that table with my father. Thank you. So we have seven minutes left. Uh, I, I, want to, I want to reiterate that um, many of the questions you asked were redundant and that you're, you're asking the same questions. Many of them were already addressed by the speaker, and uh, John will, will answer all of them online. I have two that I want to share in the time we have. One is, as, as, from an economic development standpoint, and specifically for Bristol Borough, I get the sense that uh, communities in Bucks County that are bedroom communities, let's say a lower Makefield, uh, uh, everyone is going to, I think, uh, have an easier time with home sales, regardless of where they are. Well, I'm thinking more of a community like Bristol that has a lot of empty buildings, a lot of, of uh, old industrial sites. Uh, would this be a stimulus to, 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 for the marketability of those buildings? Uh, would, would it make Bristol Borough more competitive uh, if we eliminate the property tax than it is right now? From a community uh, economic development. Yes. I see no reason why it would not be a stimulus because, again, one of the biggest problems with new businesses coming to Pennsylvania, and that's what you're going to need to, to populate those, those properties, 
the biggest impediment is the property tax. If you eliminate that, yes, I mean you're going to be in competition for those businesses, but why not? If you can if if you can get those buildings out to folks who who will come here because of the elimination of property tax, absolutely. I, I don't see why that wouldn't be an economic stimulus. Right. More, so than, more so than a community that's basically residential. Uh, well, absolutely. Well, without question. Right. Without question. And 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 it you could you could say it levels the playing field. Uh, and, yes, I mean, it would. At this point, there's. It's difficult for places like Bristol Borough, as opposed to other places that have additional sources of revenue and That's things right. like that. So it would level the playing field. So yes, it would. Yeah, from a there, there are several questions about uh, <clears throat> the property tax loophole. I mean, the, the uh, sales tax loopholes, as they were referred to in the question, that I think you addressed, and uh, how much the income tax will go up, which is 1.24. 1.27. 1.27%. 1.27. Uh, I, I think it might be helpful if you, uh, based on the questions I'm seeing, if, if you would create a model, say take a typical $50,000 a year person who's paying $3,500 a year in, in school property taxes, okay. and, and do the math, it, because I think there's three components. It's the increase in sales tax that they would pay, yeah. the increase in personal income tax they would pay, yeah. and the increase in federal tax they would pay because they're losing the deduction for property tax and, and, and to, to create some kind of a model that people could look at and, and make an individual judgment as to how uh, how that would help them. Well, rather than trying to run that through in my head, because I, I, I can't do that kind of math in my head, but what I was I, I don't know if you need to do it. I'm saying if, if you do something we could put online or something that people no, it, could Well, in at. fact, in yeah. fact, there is, if you go to the PTCC website, there is a link in the left-hand column to the calculator. There is an interactive Excel-based calculator that was developed by a member of our Coatesville group who is CEO and CFO of Cumberland Insurance. Very smart man, knows taxation and finance. Plug in your numbers for property tax, your income, your income type and source, and it'll punch out your numbers, what you can expect to save or pay extra, which is pretty unlikely, but how much you can expect to save in property taxes. It's using federal government supplied data. It's as accurate as we could possibly make it. We've been accused in the past of fudging the numbers, and that's absolutely not true. In fact, the one thing we value more than anything else is our integrity. We will not lie about this ever. And if you go and give that calculator a try, it'll give you a pretty good idea of what effect this is going to have on your finances. Did that answer the question? Yes. I wish we were online. I could punch it up in the computer and show it okay. to you. Okay, thank you. There was a question about capital improvements, which I believe you answered. You said that uh, future capital improvements would have to be funded by the district, even if it meant they have to go to referendum. That's correct. And uh, existing capital improvements would still be funded by property taxes. Yes, whatever, whatever. So that service is And not retired. necessarily ca capital improvements, but any debt on the books yeah. as of December 31st. And actually, no, future capital improvements do not necessarily have to go to referendum if the school district can afford to do it within the existing budget. Right. right. If they have to take on new debt, yes, that has to go to referendum. There's a question here about do the numbers work. You've, you've exhausted that. Um, there's a question about whether or not this entire bill could go to referendum rather than, and of course, I know Pennsylvania doesn't have that, but the question is asked, so I'd like you to respond to it. The bill could go to referendum. We oppose going to referendum. I'll tell you a quick story. Before the last gubernatorial election, a gubernatorial election, we met with both Dan Honorado and Tom Corbett to talk to them about this bill. Dan Honorado was very supportive, but insisted that it go to referendum. Now, I'll tell you why we oppose that. You would think the taxpayers would understand this and vote for it overwhelmingly. North Dakota last June had a measure on their ballot to completely eliminate their property taxes. The special interests spent more than $5 million opposing it. According to the special interests, the sky would fall and the earth as we know it would come to an end if people voted to eliminate their property tax and it was beaten down overwhelmingly. If we were to try to put this to referendum, we know the special interests, and they're out there. The Pennsylvania Bar Association, the Pennsylvania Association of School Board Officials, the Teachers Union, all oppose this bill. And you know they would spend tons of money, which we don't have. They would spend tons of money opposing it, we, and we get one shot to a referendum. If it's defeated at referendum, we're dead forever, or at least for the foreseeable future. So no, I would not want to see, the, see it go to referendum for that specific reason. We just would not be able to fight the special interest influence. Mm, can, I, can, I, can I speak about that for a second? Yeah, you know, there are times where referendums make sense. They make a lot of sense. But sometimes referendums are used by politicians to 
pass off responsibility. We run for office. We're elected. We're accountable. It's our job to make decisions. If you don't like those decisions, you can vote us out. Referendums sometimes make, make sense. They make a lot of sense. Sometimes politicians just got to stand up and they've got to show a little backbone and they've got to say yes or no. One, one last quick question. Uh, I think it's an interesting one. Person uh, indicated, w would you, why, why uh, take the sales tax to 7% and have the income tax of 1.27? Why not go to the sales tax of 8% and keep the income tax lower, or, or vice versa? W well, what, what went into that thinking? We, we try, the, the, depending on your political philosophy, in general, uh, liberal lawmakers do not like to see increases in consumption taxes. In general, conservative lawmakers don't like to see increases in income taxes. We tried to balance the bill as best we could. I think the way the two funding sources balance right now, it's about 38% on the income tax and about 45% on the sales tax, with the rest coming from other sources. The this, this sales tax obviously was going to be the big re revenue generator because of the expansion of the base. Yes, you could do that, but in the end it really doesn't matter. And We wanted a balanced bill, balanced revenue sources to try to draw the fewest objections. There were so many, there was so much thought put into this legislation, not just the moving parts, but what an effect would be on legislators looking at this and voting for or against it. We tried to satisfy both sides of the aisle as best we could to dry, try to draw support as best we could. And you've seen it in the bipartisan support we have. But that's the reason why. Yes, you can increase one much higher, and you can increase the sales tax to 8%. That's going to draw more fire. Absolutely. There are those who don't want to see it go to 8%. Yeah. This, at least it balances this way. If I could say one more thing. Those folks, if you, if you agree with what you heard tonight, and when others in the area to hear it, uh, David DeLong of the Bristol Borough Taxpayers Association has invited me to come again on the 13th of August at the IMA Fifth Ward Club at 1140 Wood Street. We'll be doing the presentation again at 7 o'clock that evening. If you want to come out or ask your friends or neighbors to come out, we'd really appreciate it. Our Thank time you. is up. Thank you very much for your time.